Uh, so my name is Pantelis Antonio, and I was tasked to see what's going on with uh, asymmetric processing, and especially uh, for a forecoming chip that was based on uh, a big little architecture. I don't know if you've noticed, but uh, the scheduler doesn't seem to be doing a very good job uh, scheduling for these kinds of things. So uh, I set out to find out uh, how we can fix that or also simulate it since no such hardware was available at that time and only now start big little systems start to coming out. So asymmetric processing is not something new. It has been around for a long, a long, a long time. But what is in, in essence is that you have multiple processing elements in the system. And usually with asymmetric processing, uh, the performance, the power envelope, and the microarchitecture of its core uh, differs widely. Uh, the archite architecture set usually was different, like having a CPU and a DSP system, or a PS3 cell, uh, TI's uh, PRU on the AM335X, uh, or mainframes with uh, the channel processing. Now, Big Little is something which is new. Uh, I don't know if you've noticed the uh, other presentations. It's the big thing that ARM is pushing for uh, when you want both high, perform high performance and low power. So what they've done it was glue together a, a Cortex-A7 low power pr uh, processor with one which is a wh higher power, the Cortex-A15. Now, uh, they both can run the sing a single kernel, have the same user space, same macri macri uh, micro architecture, and the migration cores are chip between the little cores and the big cores. Uh, there are a few very trivial programmer di visible differences, like um, the layer one instruction cast uh, line size is different. Um, the power, uh, the performance uh, monitoring unit has uh, different counters, but most people don't care about that, just the same. So I, I copied that from one of the ARM's uh, white papers. And what it means is when you have low workloads, just run them on the A7. If you have high workloads, you have to run them on the A15. But it's not as easy as it appears. So a very rough overview is that a single A15 core is about two times the performance of the A7, and the A7 core is about three times uh, more power efficient than the A15. And that's uh, actually a very rough approximation because uh, different workloads, for example, Neon uh, uh, tasks run much more faster than in uh, the A15 core than the A7. But the scheduler just thinks everything is the same, and that's not good for us. Uh, that's a typical big little system, and you see it's the same one that was in the big, li big little switcher. Uh, you have clusters of A15 and A A7 cores. You have the coherent interconnect, and the rest of the stuff, the interrupt controller, which we don't care about much. Uh, the thing that we have to notice is that um, in most implementations, the clusters are powered and have the same frequency. So it's not like you can select uh, to have each A15 or A7 core run on its own frequency. You have to clock them together and power them down together. So, yeah. We have the problem that software normally should reflect the hardware architecture of the time. So we need to find a way to measure the work done in a unit of time. Uh, now, when you have symmetric processing or a single core processor, uh, measuring the work done is, is OK. It's easy, because you just measure the time between uh, its scheduling it's scheduling period. So you can easily figure out uh, how many, let's say, MIPS or something else 
the processor was executing, and there is no difference between where the where the task was running. But when you actually try to measure the work done, it's it's much more diff difficult because you might have cast size effects, uh, I/O bandwidth differences, and the PMUs, the performance monitoring units, are not standard. So and they have a high overhead. So you, normally you don't use them as, a, as an input to the scheduler. But uh, when you don't care about power at all, the work done in a unit of time is directly proportional to the unit of time. That means you can measure the time a task takes to execute, uh, so you know uh, how many MIPS that took, and essentially you can figure out the, the power that the power consumption of that task. So to make things more simple, uh, we can try to have a very rough power scheduling example. And it's a BOGO example because uh, things are very complicated. And uh, when you try to actually work on a real example, uh, you cannot figure out things easily. So let's say you have a very simple system with one uh, Cortex-A15, which can execute two BOGO mix per second, and will consume three bo BOGO watts per second. And, and a Cortex-A7, which is, uh, executes one BOGO mix per second, and one consumes one BOGO watt per second. Uh, the workload that we're going to base our example is just run two tasks in parallel if possible, that the first one will take 16 BOGO MIPS and the second just 20. <coughs> of course, a real system is much more complicated because you have um, many other factors that affect you. So you could have tasks that are memory bound, IO bound, uh, hit the cast more, uh, or whatever. So. Let's try to come up with the most power efficient policy. So if we don't care about performance, you can just say, uh, run everything on the A7. So if we do that, we'll find out that both of the tasks will execute in 36, 36 seconds, and the power they would require would be just 36 BOGO watts. Uh, of course, that's not something that you would like to do, because that means that you have a the fast CPU just standing, standing there, don't, not, don't doing anything. So you could only use that policy if your battery is dying down. But let's try to do what hap see what happens when you, have, you try to run it as fast as possible. So that means you'll try to fill up all the capacity of the A17, and the A7 should only be used when the A15 is not available. So if you pack them together, you'll see that it will take only just 13 seconds to run, and the power would be 49 BOGO watts. Now, uh, of course, this is the, most, uh, the fastest policy. But th and this is what we want to do when you're connected to the mains power or you run some kind of high performance workload. But you wouldn't want to use it on your phone or your tablet. So let's, if you just chart those, that's, that's what this would, lo would look like. So you have one axis, which is the power, and one axis, which is the time taken. So ideally, the, you would like to have a system policy that places your workload somewhere in, that, in the line connecting those two. Now, uh, you could say that you could have a, a point where your optimal system policy would be. And that, that point would uh, rely on things like uh, the workload that you're running, whether you're running on Android and you're, let's say, on, your home, on the home screen, or you're running an application you know it doesn't take a lot of time. So you could vary the operating point along that curve so that you find what's your optimal uh, performance and power balance. Uh, 
the problem is that all this is ideal. There's no way that we can reliably know beforehand the amount of uh, time a task will take until it gets uh, to the point where it doesn't need the CPU anymore. So what we can do, we can use the history of the task execution to find out, uh, to use that as an input for our scheduling policy. Uh, so the easiest way to do that is try to find out what is the average, ta average task load. The average task load could be just the amount of time the task would run in one second period or something like that. Now, we can measure the CPU, CPU load of the, time, of the task, but we don't have any way to measure power. But uh, if we have uh, an idea of what the different uh, power efficiency of its core is, we can assign a number according to the amount of, of, uh, of time that task would, uh, would take. The thing is, uh, the scheduler doesn't, does not track either MIPS power or, uh, or power efficiency. So we have to use a different method to get the scheduler to do our work. Now, so let's go to what, what's the Linux scheduler now? Uh, I don't know if you know about that. It's, it's much better than it used to be. Uh, it doesn't have any weird tunables. It seems to work. Um, it uses uh, pretty, a pretty simple algorithm comparatively. And the idea behind it is that you have an, a virtual processor, which you assign a slice of the real processor to it. So it's, it's simple to, to do what we want to do, and the conceptual model is simple. You just, if you have three tasks to run, you should give its task uh, one third of the CPU time. Of course, you have uh, priorities, and all those all those things are calculated by by math. You don't have some kind of magic value that says, okay, you need to do this if this task is interactive, or you do need to do that if the task is uh, I/O bound or CPU bound. Uh, the thing is, the scheduler doesn't doesn't do. Et doesn't have anything to do with the, the power, with the power management facilities of the, of, the, of the kernel. So it assumes that the power, the power policy thing is something completely separate. So you have CPU freak, so you have um, uh, thermal management or whatever you need to do, but there's no uh, communication between that and the scheduler. Uh, the thing is, when you start thinking about power, uh, that's a pretty, it's, it's pretty bad because that means that your system is reactive, it's not proactive. It will try to do something after your, you, you've crossed some kind of uh, threshold and it will try to find balance again. But it's simple and it works now. So we need to have a way to track uh, the history of the load of a task. So that's what the per entity load average tracking patches do. It's a pretty recent development by Paul Turner. <coughs> and tracks loads by uh, adding together the per scheduling entity, which is a scheduling entity is a task too. Uh, per task instead of per uh, run queue. So that means instead of having uh, the load being calculated on its uh, CPU, it is calculated per, uh, per task and then it is summed together to come up with, a, with the load of, of that uh, run queue. It is pretty accurate. It is, it is not prone to artifacts compared that has to do with the, with the time where uh, the sampling of that uh, of the, of the load calculation and sub. Uh, and it is actually the basis for all work on asymmetric processing and the basis on, of the Linaro HMP patches. Uh, since ARM uses big little and they want to sell a lot of chips there, they have to do something with that situation. So there's uh, 
a very big activity there. So they want to teach all these things that Big Little needs to do uh, to the learning scheduler. They do use the parentity load tracking patches to assign tasks, and they also need more. So they have some uh, topology, pa topology patches that uh, assign relative l the relative power of its uh, CPU to the some scheduler uh, internal structure so that you know uh, so that you can deduce the amount of of, uh, of power its CPU takes compared comparatively. So I don't know if you've looked in the scheduler. The, there is a, a maximum, which is about 1,024 uh, assigned assigned weight for its CPU, and they what they they do they they scale that according to the relative power of the processor. So that means when you use that those values in your load average calculations, they are sta stable in time. So what happens uh, if you have to calculate uh, the load average of a task, you have to take into account uh, you have to take into account where the task runs because if it runs on the fast CPU, its load is different than the one if it's run if it runs on the slow CPU. So when migration happens, you need to make sure that the history of the task is invariant compared to compared to where it's running and where it has been run. And that that helps us there. So the thing is, it's a little bit invasive. Uh, there are lots of uh, if defs in the in the scheduler source code, and a little bit big, little specific, because they have the concept of a, a down domain and an up domain, where the down domain is. Uh, the, little, the domain of the little CPUs and the up domain is the domain of the big CPUs. And they track the load of each task when, when it crosses a threshold, the task is migrated to the up domain and when it falls down uh, below that threshold, it, it's migrated to the down domain. There are a few problems with this approach. The, the first problem is that you are dependent on the latency of the load average tracking. So uh, if, you're, if you're calculating your uh, load average in a, with a very small period, that means that a task that runs for a very small time is characterized as wanting to use the big CPU and it will be migrated immediately to the, to the, to the app domain, which is not really what you want. You want to have a more slow uh, tracking of that value. So one of the first changes they did that they have a way to uh, modify the load tracking average to something larger than the original thing, which is just 32 milliseconds to something like 250 milliseconds. So the task has to be running for a considerable more time until it gets uh, put on the big CPU. On the other hand, that means that if you have a task that you know that's interactive, it has to wait uh, for that amount of, uh, of time until it gets migrated. So uh, it's a little bit hard to, to find the right balance. So uh, ideally, you, you would need to have a way to, to predict in a more fine manner what the what the future behavior of the task will be. So instead of an average, maybe you could have uh, uh, something that's uh, based on, the, on, on where the task was waiting. Maybe have a per weight, per weight queue uh, estimate of how much time the task will take after it wakes up. Well, that's a bit into the future. Now, there are, of course, other people working on that. So we have the Alexis PowerWare patches, which is more generic, and it's nothing big little specific. 
but it should offer improvements on every power aware system. It does rely on the per entity load average patch set. And it has the assumption that uh, run to idle is beneficial to power management, which indeed is the case in symmetric processing systems, but not, not quite right for big little systems. It packs tasks as in as few as possible core and clusters so that it can uh, power down the ones that are not running. And I think it has a better, better chance of getting into mainline before the HMP patches of Limaro. Now, there are other things that people are looking at, like uh, the Paul McKinney's hot plug cleanup. Uh, what happens is uh, when you don't need a core, you, you want to shut it down. But the hot, hot plug operations up to now were something that were, was only done on big server systems, and they never really, really took into account how fast this operation takes. So uh, there are cases where it could take something like 500 milliseconds, and people have been working on that, and I think they, it's much better now. It's, I think it's down to a few tens of milliseconds. So when you have a policy that allows you to put down, put those CPU to, to power them off, you can use that and it's much faster. Uh, now we have the cluster aware idle, idle patches because as I said earlier, the, the SOCs do not have its CPU on its own power domain. So you might need to coordinate access between those CPUs in order to be able to put the, the cluster into power down. And I know you probably know the big little switcher, which is, was a, a previous presentation, and it treats the big little, the whole big little problem as a, a problem of a CPU freak. But it's not as efficient as uh, MP scheduling, but it's going to work, it's, which is not something that we can say about. MP scheduling. So what happens when you actually want to try all these things? Uh, big little systems are pretty hard to come by. The only known uh, big little system that you can get n right now, I think it's ARM's versatile core tile express, which has two Cortex-A15s and three A7s. It is available, but I think uh, out of the hands of the community, it, it's a few thousand of dollars. Uh, next one is the Samsung Exynos 5 Octa. Should be available soon, and there should be something called OMAP 6 on the way, but it's not going to happen. And that's uh, the part that I was working on. So how do you simulate that? Well, you could use ARM's fast model emulator. The problem is that it's quite slow for uh, doing anything with the scheduler. Uh, you can only try sim synthetic benchmarks or very small fragments. You can use it to verify the hardware design and the software design, but it's pretty slow for collecting data. Now since I was doing this for TI, a very cheap way to simulate it would be on the PANA board, ES, which is two Cortex-A9s. It's not a big, big little system, but we'll see we have ways to simulate that pretty, pretty closely. Uh, the kernel it uses is, is in the main line, which is pretty important when you're doing scheduling work. And you also have access to some Android, uh, Android kernels, which are not mainline, but you actually want to use them because all the relevant consumer stuff that you want to do on Linux is Android. So, and it's very cheap. So, how can you check? Uh, the performance of, of the scheduler. You can use perf, which is part of the Linux kernel. Perf is not just for 
profiling. It can also you you can also use it to monitor things uh, in the kernel, like scheduling events. And you, there's pretty good facilities there. Uh, there is a problem with Perf, though. It is not portable between architectures, and there are differences between kernel versions. So you might have a kernel version that your perf trace won't work on a different kernel version. So you, that's a problem when you try to use Android, because Android usually doesn't have the latest kernel. And when you capture something there and you try to use it as an input on a later kernel, it won't work. And the best way to visualize what's running on the CPU is just use perf time chart. Perf, ta perf time chart uses a, a perf trace and it generates uh, an SVG file that uh, you can see what's running and where in your system. So I don't know if you've used it before, but that's all you have to do just to get a feel of what's running. It's pretty simple. Now, what's not simple is compiling perf for Android, but that's... The problem is that it looks something like this. I don't know if you can tell what's running or not. Uh, it's pretty complicated. <laughs> okay. Does it run on Android? Really? Well, it's a data file. You get the data file, and then you can run it on XA6, but the data is comes from Android. Okay. Good. Or not Android. Yeah, it just needs F trace. Okay. Now, the SVG files generated are pretty big. Uh, so for a run of about 10 seconds, you might expect a file of a few megabytes. You can use Inkscape to, to open it and then export it. It, it is a mess when you see it, but after a while you can see what's going on and it's easy to figure it out. And you can also see power events. So when you have uh, a system that CPU freak works, you can actually see the power transitions so you know what the scheduler is doing and CPU perf. So it looks some, something like this. And what we really care is about the per CPU utilization. Well, you could write something that pulls the CPU load periodically, but that's not accurate enough for what we want to measure. So, and we have the problem that all the stuff that you want to do for a consumer would be from Android. And like it or not, it's the de facto consumer level Unix API. So what I did, just wrote a, s a very small extension to, to, to perf. It just allows you to take that uh, perf output and have a per CPU, pretty accurate per CPU utilization. Now, as I, as I mentioned, when you do scheduler hacking, you want to do it uh, to the main line. You don't want to work on older versions. And you cannot do that when you have to run Android. And you want to run Android because all the hardware works in Android. You have your GPU, GPU working. Uh, again, it's really hard to do work on the main line. And keep it in sync with your Android drop. So what I did was capture data in, the, in an oldest, oldest kernel running Android, and then do, did my work on, on the main line. So how can I, what can I use to capture workloads uh, portably? And I can use it on, on anywhere I want to run. So I had to write another thing. 
So SPR replay, scheduler playback replay. I know what you're going to say. There is a, already a facility about uh, capturing workloads on using perf and then replaying them, but it's not exactly what I needed. Uh, what you can do, you, you can use that to, on a perf capture, and then you generate simple instructions that uh, have encapsulated the way that the scheduler works. So instead of having a, a trace that says uh, a, schedu a, schedule a scheduling out happened at that point of time, you have uh, a program that explains what the, pro the, the, program the system was doing at that time. So you have, it's a, just a simple uh, text file which has the name of the process running, the PID, and a number of instructions for what the scheduler was doing at that time. It's pretty portable, and if you see a capture, it's easy to understand what's doing, what, what is, it is doing. <coughs> so what are the instructions? You have an instruction that says burn a number of uh, burn CPU for a number of uh, nanoseconds, which is what uh, a CPU bound program would do. We don't care about uh, anything else. We, the scheduler only cares about the the program running. Uh, sleep, which means uh, you should sleep for a number of nanoseconds. A spawn, which is capturing uh, what happens when a task does. Does a fork, clone parent, which is the parent side of a fork, and clone child, which is the, the child side of the fork, a wait ID, which is uh, waiting on an, an, a, on a, on a event, which another task would use to signal with a signal ID. And that's all. Uh, so, how how you do, you do that? So just just run record, capture your workload, uh, execute uh, time chart so that you have a graphical way to see what's going on. Uh, use that to see the the task that was running. That's uh, its line is the name of the task, the PID, and its runtime. Uh, you could also capture uh, the behavior of a specific task, and when you do that, all the other tasks just go away, and you have a simple, a simple uh, example. So a CPU cycle just runs for two seconds, and if you just do that, you see that it's burning CPU for two seconds. And after you have that capture, you can execute it on a different system, and there's no portability issues there. So do you have any questions up to now? OK. So that kind of handles the way of capturing data about evaluating a big little system or a simulated big little system. Now we have to see how we can simulate a big little system on a platform that, that's not big little. So the problem when capturing uh, data from uh, an interactive workload is that you have to have a pretty close approximation of the user experience. So you cannot use a synthetic test. Uh, it's not what you want to do. It's, you want to see exactly how <coughs> a real user would use your system. So if you're running on an x86 system, you're pretty lucky because uh, the CPUs have individual CPU-free controls. But you're not as lucky you know, on ARM systems because its, uh, it's cluster has its own power domain and CPU frequency. So the CPUs are dependent on each other. So I had to find a way to simulate that. 
what I come up with is this. It's a virtual CPU freak driver. So as part of, I don't know if you've ever seen a system under uh, an RQ storm where when you have too many interrupts, your system just hangs. Or if, it, if the interrupt rate is not as large, you might just slow down. The thing is, interrupts are invisible to the scheduler. So if you had a way to generate uh, interrupts directly uh, routed to a specific CPU, you could slow down its CPU accordingly so that you could simulate a big little system. So what you really need is just a way to route an interrupt to a specific CPU and a way to calculate what the interrupt rate would be and how much time would you wait in the interrupt. Uh, virtual CPU FREC has two backends. One backend is using uh, DM timers that's so map specific, but it's pretty accurate. And there's also a generic backend that uses high resolution timers. It's not as accurate, but if you don't have that, um, if you don't have a very accurate timer, you can make it work. A few config, op config options, just how to enable it and stuff like that. What it looks in practice. So I don't know if you can see that, but uh, there's no line that says this CPU 0 is uh, dependent on CPU frequency of the CPU 1. So they're unbound now. And if you use this, that's when, on the Panda, when, when you set the maximum frequency, a CPU cycle just cycles for one second, and it outputs a, a counter that says how many loops during that second happen. It's similar to the way that the Bogomips calculation is in the kernel. So when you set them on the both CPUs and the maximum frequency, uh, you have some a number close to how much is that? About eight, eighty-seven million. And when I use that to set just uh, the CPUs, CPU zero to a lower frequency, uh, we have a lower value. And if we do the math there you see that if you were to use the, the hardware way to set the frequency, you would have a ratio of uh, 0.76, <coughs> while the ratio using uh, virtual CPU freak is, is pretty close. And the thing is, it has absolutely no effect on the scheduler. It's like, as far as it's concerned, it's like running on, or having a CPUs that are just different. So, as I said, I mentioned the Linaro MP patches. It's, it, it just partitions the CPUs into two domains, uh, fast and slow. It uses uh, per-entity load average patches to track load for its task and a way to migrate processes to and from the domains. Uh, the estimates are not always correct, though. And and interactive workloads are not easily characterized by the load average. Uh, in, if you were to try to figure out why this happens, it's interactive uh, tasks have a, an event loop. And according to, to the event that um, ends up in the event loop, a uh, different CPU time will, will be needed to execute uh, the handler for that event. So a mouse event might uh, use CPU time for, I don't know, 200 milliseconds, but um, a key press and render, for example, in a web browser would use more CPU. And when you use the, just the load average, it does, doesn't make any sense. Uh, well, I, I managed to do some work using the 
MP patches of Lunaro and some changes of my own. And this is a run from the Facebook application in Android. Uh, as you can see, it's pretty messy, but what you see is that the, while the system was idle and lots of work was being done on the little, little cluster, the CPU zero, uh, a task that took more time appeared, and after a, a little amount of time running on the on CPU zero, ended up migrating to CPU one. So it works pretty good, but it's not ideal yet. Okay, so that's the state of things right now. But okay, so how can we fix that? Uh, it's, there has to be a way to fix it. And I think that the way to fix it is try to figure out what we want to do with the power scheduling. Uh, the scheduler as it is right now doesn't care at all about power. It doesn't even track it. First thing, the first thing that we need to do is track the amount of power a task took while executing. It's a similar way that the load average patches work, we need to have a power <coughs> consumption average patches, maybe. Uh, another thing that's very problematic is that the kernel is reactive. So you do something, uh, the load com goes up, and then you have to react to it and then do something else. What we need to do is try to have a way to predict the behavior of, uh, of the task and do changes beforehand. So. Um, let's say you have a system that's idle and then the user presses a key. Uh, we should be able to detect that something is going to take place and increase the frequency or switch to the big domain before the user experiences uh, uh, latency. Now, that's a pretty big change, but it's not impossible. Uh, there is something similar that goes on each time when you use a recent CPU, and that's pretty similar to branch prediction. Uh, it is possible to predict branches pretty accurately now, so it should be possible to predict task wake-ups too. So how would you, how should we op continue? Maybe keep an estimate of the predicted CPU load at its times and affect change to the power policy before that condition triggers. But for all this to work, that means instead of having the, all the power related uh, facilities pretty much isolated, we should do that as a, have that work under the control of the scheduler. So the scheduler should know that I'm going to need more CPU time in, the couple, in a couple of seconds. So trigger that change before that. As you can see, the, this is a very much, very much work in progress. We are, we are doing, we're, we're, we're doing something, but it's not, we're not quite there yet. So if you have any ideas, just, just let, let, let us know. Um, I was doing my best, but it wasn't enough. It's still, it's still an un unsolved problem. So, any questions? Yes, there is. Uh, okay, you would try to drink from a fire hose. The events are generated at you know, a tremendous rate. So that's why Perf is pretty good at that. You can get the data pretty fast. You could write your own uh, tool that connects to the Perf interface and just pull them yourself. But it's not as simple as just an SysFS attribute file. Uh, 
Yeah, there are statistics. But, but that's different. Yeah, it is useful, but it's not uh, events. It's different. It's more, it's an average. If you need the events, you have to use something else. Yeah? Just a, just a comment. Like, as far as the anticipatory business, there's a pretty large body of research that goes academic type stuff, you know, all over the place that goes back probably 20, 30 years and on in the space of real time and trying to figure out like how you could, uh, you know, essentially anticipatory, can I ramp up, power up the voltage and frequency, mm -hmm. uh, anticipating, you know, that I'm going to need full power on the CPU in order to execute my time critical stuff. So, can, there are definitely some work that's already been done. Yeah, the thing is we have a multi-dimensional problem. Right. You have to balance uh, power, you have to balance performance, <coughs> latency, uh, thermal considerations. It's like you have multiple di dimensions that you have to... Matrix. Yeah. Which yeah, but the thing is, scheduler hackers don't want to do any kind of uh, matrix multiplications in the scheduler. And you have to do all your calculations in fixed point and using lookup tables. So that complicates things even more. Uh, race to idle makes sense in an SMP environment, but in a big little environment, it might be better for you to run your task on the little CPU if you know that it's not going to take so much time. It's a matter of finding the balance. Because the task, when it runs on the little CPU, uh, consumes one third of the power that will consume on the big CPU. And if you don't care about latency, run it there. Yes? Yes, that's a part of the Linaro patches. They do do that. And you have to do that. Otherwise, <coughs> yes, and that's it. That's, that's the whole idea. The thing is, um, you put weights in order to keep your uh, load average metric uh, valid. Because if you don't put weights and you just keep track of time, that means when you migrate, all your history is gone because it's, it's bogus. Yes? Have you thought any, um, what the implications of having a deadline scheduler might be for, for this, whether it could help or, or not? Well, it could help as a component, as a dimen dimension of latency. So if you put latency in that uh, consideration, then you have the deadline scheduler, oh, something okay. like the deadline okay. scheduler. Let us say that's, that's kind of more than just deadline. I mean, you're, you're, you're talking about to be proactive. Mm -hmm. And uh, the concept of the scatter, at least, is that you can actually uh, ensure that your task has a certain utilization. Yes, the thing is, you have to use something in your task to say how much I'm gonna, how much time I'm gonna take. You yeah. have to configure it. Yeah. We're just talking about running Android applications, and Android applications are out there. There's no way that you can get an app developer to measure all those things that are needed to configure your, the, um, the parameters that the, like, the like Well, the good developers could do that, but uh, you know, the other guys that just run, write fart apps, there's no way that they can. There's actually a lot of interest in the, in the deadline schedule for various people. It, it's kind of like in the background, you don't really hear too much about it. But no, no, it, 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 it's it's it is very useful. But it's just one dimension of the problem. It's like you have multiple dimensions now. Yeah. That's just what I was wondering if that helps much at all, if you can really consider much. We're just kind of not, not on the radar yet. Yeah. It's, the scheduler is, was written for a different time period. You know, things have changed, and we need to change with them. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Uh, 
Yes. yes. And that's the part of what I'm talking about. It's more than one dimension. So you could have cas effects, you know, cas affinity and task affinity, and you should take that into account when you migrate. So it's it's not like there, it's a, there's a single thing that you can do and it will fix everything. It looks like we need to attack the, the problem from all sides. Anyone else? Okay, so thank you very much for being here.